Healthy Conversations is made possible through a grant from the William L. and Ruth T. Pendleton Memorial Fund. Hi, I'm Jason Weinstein, a board-certified, fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon in joint replacement at Dignity Health Yavapai Regional Medical Group, who today is going to talk to you about hip arthritis. So I think it's really important to talk about arthritis of the hip as osteoarthritis, because so many people believe that um, rheumatoid arthritis, which is very different than garden variety osteoarthritis is the arthritis they have. Osteoarthritis is typically, as the slide shows you, a wear and tear arthritis. Um, it happens as people get older, and it's one of the most common morbidities in the United States population in people over age 50. Approximately 31 million adults live with some form of osteoarthritis, and about 20 million of those suffer from hip arthritis specifically. In the senior population, arthritis is the leading cause of disability. And as such, it has a tremendous economic burden. So a little bit of anatomy. If you'll notice on the slide, within the black circle, there is an arthritic joint. And if you look at the other hip on the contralateral side, you'll see that the ball portion is very, very clean. So that clean appearance is really representing normal cartilage. Normal cartilage has a very glistening, almost shiny, rubbery appearance to it. But in a joint with arthritis, the hip joint in this slide, in the black circle, you'll notice that it's very kind of lumpy and bumpy. And so what we see on x-ray are bone spurs, which are the bumps around the joints. We see loss of joint space so that the ball part, which is contained in the socket of the pelvis, is very much narrowed. So because the cartilage is narrowed, we see the space between the ball and the socket very narrowed. I often explain to patients that it's like tire tread you're born with a specific thickness of tire tread, and as such, over time, that tire tread th um, thins, and so that allows the ball and socket to get closer to one another, and I jokingly will say it's not a very romantic relationship. So hip arthritis, really the hallmark is bone spurs, loss of joint space, and kind of a lumpy, bumpy appearance to the joint. Everybody wants to know why. Um, there are kind of no specific reasons why most people have hip arthritis. In fact, most people don't have a specific cause, but there are kind of some general categories that we discuss, like family history. So I often will ask patients if they have a relative who has a, um, arthritis, and very commonly the answer will be yes, arthritis seems to run in my family. Um, aging, as I mentioned, so everybody over age 50 is at risk of developing arthritis. And again, we're talking specifically about osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear type of arthritis. Obesity, which is obviously a, an epidemic in the United States that um, truly puts more force on the hip joint than um, is um, normal. And those increased weights and increased forces on the hip joint predispose people with obesity to having early onset hip arthritis. Injury is another way people can get arthritis. So that could be through a trauma like a motor vehicle accident where somebody has had a fracture around the hip joint or maybe they had a dislocated hip joint. All of those things disrupt that beautiful glistening cartilage that we're born with and that can predispose to hip osteoarthritis. <clears throat> infection, we often hear about um, people who have had infections as children who develop arthritis, that's called septic arthritis, and um, that can be another pathway that leads to osteoarthritis down the road. Um, malignancy is a rare cause, but it can be. Uh, most commonly in adults, cancer that comes from either the breast, the prostate, lung or usually the kidney 
that metastasizes to bone and leads to early destruction of the hip joint. The last thing is hip dysplasia, a very common, uh, often under-recognized cause of hip arthritis, which essentially affects the way the ball and the socket are aligned with one another. So some people, unfortunately, are born with hips that are um, out of the socket, and many of you may have seen those types of patients um, as children where they uh, are told that they had to wear a brace for six months or even longer. Some people need surgery to put the ball back in the socket because they had severe dysplasia at birth. So dysplasia is certainly a, a factor that can lead people to have osteoarthritis down the road. There are adults who have very mild forms of dysplasia they never knew as a child. Um, but the ball was not perfectly aligned at birth, and they only find out in their 40s, 50s, or 60s that they had hip dysplasia probably their entire life that has predisposed them to osteoarthritis of the hip. So what do patients present with? <clears throat> Usually the classic, classic uh, complaint is groin pain, okay? Many people will point to their lower back mistakenly thinking that the back is the hip, but I always tell patients that it's hip arthritis is truly a below the belt arthritis. The groin is the most classic symptom. Sometimes patients will have pain on the, the outside of their hip, um, but most commonly it's a groin pain. They might feel a sense of inflammation like a toothache type pain in their groin. Um, they may feel grinding here, popping or catching with getting up out of a chair or going upstairs. They may feel stiffness very commonly. One of the things I do in clinic is I ask patients to cross their legs and about nine times out of 10, somebody with a significantly affected hip joint will not be able to cross the affected leg over the unaffected leg. Most patients will say that they have difficulty with activities of daily living and that really refers to Things like golf, tennis, walking, going upstairs, going downstairs sometimes specifically. These are the things that are typically affected um, with hip arthritis. So how do we treat it? Um, you know, there are many, many ways to treat arthritis and I think a good framework for trying to uh, understand how we treat it is when the physician says, is it mild, moderate, or severe? Mild arthritis, is typically treated with things like exercise and weight loss. So even if that means um, increasing the uh, walking distance that you do each day, whether you keep that with a Fitbit or just mentally, even losing five pounds can have a significant effect on the way your hip feels. Because you have to remember that the amount of force that is transmitted across the hip joint is actually fairly significant it's kind of like taking a chair with four legs, and if you were to put your hand under one of those legs, you can just see all the force going down that one leg, and that's kind of what's going on in the hip as you walk. So even a very small five pound weight loss can lead to significant reduction in pain. <clears throat> Activity modification can be helpful, especially if you have mild or moderate arthritis. The activity modification might mean um, so you like to jog, um, maybe that means you're going to have to just walk or, or develop fast paced walking or take up something like an exercise bike or maybe um, do treadmill or um, do some easy hiking instead of high impact running. So activity modification can be very helpful for people, although what usually I hear is that people want to continue with their usual activities. Um, so we try to find some kind of common ground where there is activity modification, but people are able to continue doing the things that they love to do. <clears throat> Anti-inflammatories are this big catch-all category for treating um, hip arthritis and other forms of arthritis as well, whether it be the knee or the back. And anti-inflammatories like Advil, Aleve, um, naproxen, ibuprofen, Motrin, and so on are all fairly effective. The only caution would be is if you have a history of significant cardiovascular disease or if you have 
stomach ailments like gastritis or you get reflux, those are patients who probably should be a little bit cautioned when they start on an anti-inflammatory. Acetaminophen or Tylenol is often used to treat arthritis. It's pretty safe unless you have liver problems or if you're going to drink alcohol, that would probably be discouraged in conjunction with taking Tylenol. Nutritional supplements are this gigantic uh, billion dollar industry that a lot of people come to clinic with um, lists of things they're taking for their arthritis. And I'm often asked what works and what does not work. The, the, the um, answer is, uh, you know, we as a population have really kind of embarked on this um, experiment. Everybody wants to run to the, the health store and buy vitamins and think that they're cured. But the answer really is that nothing has truly been proven to cure hip arthritis or, re or reverse the natural course. Um, I think there are supplements like omega fatty acids, which in general work to reduce inflammation. Um, those are probably a good bet. And then more recently, we're hearing things about like turmeric, for example, as a potential anti-inflammatory nutritional supplement. But I mean, I will see all types of names I don't even recognize, um, ginkgo biloba, um, St. John's wort, um, ginger. The science really isn't there to support them, but I, I say if, if it makes you feel better and uh, it's not hard on the wallet, then it's probably okay to take, but I can't give you really scientific evidence that it's working. Injections are kind of a mainstay of um, treating arthritis in general. In, in the knee, um, injections can be very, very helpful and they're much more predictable than they are in the hip. So cortisone injections, for example, um, are very effective in the knee, less predictable in the hip. There are visco supplements like Synvisc and Monovisc and Gelsin and the list just goes on. And those are FDA approved for treatment in the knee, but they are not FDA approved for treatment in the hip. So I usually don't recommend visco supplement or joint lubrication type injections for the hip because they just really aren't approved for it. And they can be quite expensive, usually a $500 um, out of pocket expense that isn't covered by insurance. Surgery, the last option, really recommended for patients who have severe arthritis. So that's again, for patients who have bone on bone, as it's called, arthritis, where there is no more cartilage, and those patients have failed conservative treatment. Usually they've been on some type of medication. Usually they've given an attempt at exercise or weight loss or physical therapy to try and alleviate their pain. And when all of that has failed, I think surgery is a very reasonable um, intervention. So, <clears throat> Before I get into the details of what hip replacement is, I think it's important to know that hip replacement is a very, very successful procedure. Um, it has really been coined as one of the few surgeries of the century, okay? And that's because about 95% of people do extremely well with hip replacement. Um, we can't say that about knee replacement. It, with patients who've had knee replacement, it's about 80% of patients do really well. But for hip replacement, we're at about 95%, which is a very, very robust um, success rate. You'd be hard pressed to find that type of success rate in any other type of surgery, whether it be appendectomy or a gallbladder removal or even um, you know, elective like herniorrhaphy for hernias. So a very successful surgery and what it basically is, is it takes the ball that you see in the picture and that ball part is removed because the ball part really serves no purpose. It's this lumpy, bumpy um, road that rubs against the socket of your hip. And so in hip replacement, the ball is replaced with an artificial ball and that is attached to a stem that is fit inside the shaft of the bone that you see in the picture, that long portion of the bone going down towards your knee. And then on the socket side, the damaged cartilage is resurfaced. And so a cup, as we refer to it, is put in the socket, and that cup captures the new ball, and that is the essence of a hip replacement. 
We don't replace the pelvis. The pelvis is just resurfaced, but we do replace the ball with an artificial ball that is secured through a stem that is inserted precisely into the shaft of the femur. So hip replacement has become very confusing for a lot of people because there's been a lot of media talks about minimally invasive and what does that mean? And uh, some of it is industry sponsored. And so there may be some bias in what is conveyed to people. So I kind of want to boil this down. Every approach to hip replacement surgery is highly successful, okay? And I think ultimately what it comes down to is who your surgeon is and how um, satisfied are you with your understanding of what might work and what might not work. Some approaches are better for certain patients and some approaches are worse for certain patients. The posterior approach is the classic approach that about um, everybody coming out of orthopedic training knows, okay? Lateral approach is less used, and more commonly over the past decade, there has been this what's called a direct anterior approach. And that's the one that has received a lot of media coverage because we don't cut any muscles. With the posterior or the lateral approach, we go through muscles, and that can lead to some issues with recovery, not the least of which is pain and um, a slower recovery in general. The direct anterior approach is called a mini anterior approach or a muscle sparing total hip replacement because again, we go through natural muscle planes, not through muscles and their fibers directly. So I wanna kind of drill down a little bit more on the anterior hip replacement because I think it's a beautiful procedure, um, but there are, there are disadvantages and I think one thing that's important for people to know is that there is a significant learning curve. Um, that learning curve is not five patients. It tends to be 50 or 100 or 200 patients. And a lot of surgeons don't want to learn that into the, their career out of training because there are complications associated that can be fairly devastating to the patient and then felt uh, by the surgeon as well. So <clears throat> let me cover the advantages. There is less pain than the posterior approach in general, and that's because no muscles are cut. The recovery is fairly rapid. Most of my patients either go home the same day or the day after surgery, and um, they're back to doing their activities for the most part by about six to eight weeks. Um, we don't give precautions. A lot of people who have had hip replacements are told, well, you can't cross your legs, you can't lift your leg past 90 degrees. And most people feel like that's torture because they did the operation to have more freedom, not less freedom. So the anterior approach really affords patients um, no post-surgical limitations because um, the muscles are not disrupted by surgery and because um, the natural muscle envelope is left in place. So it's just inherently more stable. The other thing I should mention is that the dislocation risk, the chance of the ball coming out of the socket is less with the anterior approach than with the other approaches. And that has been well shown in published data. The disadvantage, as I mentioned, there's a very steep learning curve. So uh, the challenge for the surgeon is getting over that learning curve I've done many thousands of these, and I always tell my patients, this approach is much easier on the patient, and it's a little harder on the surgeon. Fractures of the femur can occur. They do not usually occur with other approaches, but that, again, is one of the risks that patients need to evaluate when they're trying to decide what approach they want. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I think import is, that's important to know is that 10 to 20% of orthopedic surgeons perform the surgery. So, I think it's not only important to find an orthopedic surgeon, but more importantly, an orthopedic surgeon who is fellowship trained in arthroplasty and who has the additional expertise in having done a lot of anterior approach cases. I think as a patient, it is your, uh, to your benefit and you should ask your surgeon, what is your training in arthroplasty? 
Have you done a fellowship? How many cases have you done? And I think these are very healthy parts of the conversation because if I was a patient, I'd wanna know if my surgeon's done 5, 50, or 500, or 5,000. I think that might make a difference. So I think asking questions about the expertise level of your surgeon is very important. The data has shown that surgeons who are past their learning curve, as you might expect, have a much less risk of complications, um, namely fracture, um, as a complication of the anterior hip surgery. Well, that's where I wanna leave uh, this talk. I hope you um, feel that you're a little bit more educated about hip arthritis and the options to treat it. And I think now would be a great time to take questions. I always get questions about anesthesia and I think that's, again, a very important part of the conversation because my preference in general is for patients to have spinal anesthetic. And everybody, you know, as soon as they envision the idea of a needle going into their spine, um, that evokes fear. And uh, maybe they knew somebody who had a complication. The reality is I've been doing this for 17 years and I do a very high volume of hip replacements, easy to very complex, and usually spinal um, anesthesia, which is anesthesia injected from the back that essentially paralyzes um, the patient for a few hours. In 17 years, I've had two spinal headaches. I've never had any other complications. And so I think spinal anesthesia is always the preferred anesthesia because when it wears off, the patient is wide awake, um, not like they've been schnockered with liquor from general anesthesia. And the data does show that the risk of having a blood clot um, is less with spinal anesthesia, bleeding is less, and just the overall chance of being readmitted to the hospital. So if you've had prior spinal surgery, like uh, spinal fusion or maybe multi-level discectomies um, or any surgery that has led to scarring, you might be less of a candidate for spinal um, anesthesia but overall in a virgin spine that's never had any prior surgery, that has no curvature or abnormalities, spinal anesthesia is preferred for those reasons. The right approach I think should be discussed with your, with your surgeon. I think it's always good to ask your surgeon what approach they're most comfortable with. If, for example, they only do posterior approach, but you're interested in a quicker recovery, no muscles cut, um, less risk of dislocation, maybe you should seek a second opinion. And I think that's um, you know, a good way to try and understand what approach is best for you. I will say that since with the anterior approach, the incision is made literally near the groin crease, People uh, are obese and maybe have a big overlying panis or a big overlying fold of skin on their groin, probably aren't uh, perfect candidates for an anterior approach because there might be a higher risk of infection in those patients. So posterior approach would probably be a better approach for that specific subset of patients. Anterior hip replacement surgeries are done by about uh, 10 to 20% of fellowship trained arthroplasty surgeons in the United States. Um, they are becoming a lot more common. Um, certainly in every big city, um, anterior hip replacement has received a lot of hype due to the benefits um, it really affords patients. I like to ask the patient, um, you know, well, what are you feeling? And I think if my, the answer I'm hearing is I, I have tried conservative management of some form, whether that be medications or physical therapy or weight loss or exercise, and nothing seems to be working, then I think hip replacement is certainly an option. Again, almost every time my patients tell me, Doc, it's time. I feel like it's time. 
And it's, it's intuitive, I think, for a lot of patients. They, they uh, like to do the conservative things, but they just intuitively know when it's time. Uh, their quality of life is diminished. They've been at it for three to six months or many years, and they are ready, they are ready to take that um, next step and proceed with hip replacement. And so, uh, again, I don't tell my patients that it's time to have hip replacement. Again, I think the important thing to know is that hip replacement is really, it's an elective surgery. You're not gonna die from hip arthritis. It's just a quality of life improvement. And I think the thing that has amazed me over the course of my career is that you know quality of life as you get older is so paramount to a healthy lifestyle for most patients that I've been told many times that patients would rather, um, you know, they'd rather die than live with the way their hips um, are um, because the thought of being more mobile and being able to play golf and tennis and hike and bike and things like that are just um, great benefits that I think people really appreciate. So um, kind of the long-winded answer is most patients know when it's time, but certainly you need to have failed some kind of conservative treatment before you take that next step. I hope everybody enjoyed this talk and everybody feels more educated about uh, hip arthritis and when it might be time to consider surgery. Thank you for attending this talk.